Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience, and welcome to the webinar titled Streamlining a Global Life Sciences Company's Pharmacovigilance Operations, presented by Dr. Rodney Lemery, Vice President of Safety and Pharmacovigilance at Biofarm Systems. I'm Eugene Stefanov, the Marketing Manager at Biofarm, and I'll be going over some housekeeping items before I turn it over to Rodney. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speaker at any time today by typing them in the chat feature located on the left side of your screen. Please note that other webinar participants will not see your questions or comments. Nonetheless, your questions to the speaker will be addressed as time allows towards the end of the presentation. If you still have unanswered questions after the webinar or would like to request additional information from Biofarm, feel free to visit the company's website for contact information. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Biofarm's website within 24 hours. We will also be emailing you a link to the recording. This concludes our housekeeping items. I would now like to turn the call over to Rodney Lemery. Thank you, Eugene. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where in the world you're joining us today. I'd like to begin by just going over the agenda for our webinar today. We would like to begin by giving you a summary of the situation of the globalization of a particular client that we have recently worked with. You can think of this webinar as really a part two to our webinar previously uh, executed in where we spoke of the technical capabilities of implementing the globalization of the Argus safety system for a, a U.S.-based company that is now going global. This, if you will, is part two, and we're focusing on the process reengineering aspects of that project. We will also be covering the descriptions of our methodologies that we use here at Biofarm to conduct uh, most of our process reengineering uh, projects, all of those within the, the safety group. We will talk specifically about the results of this methodology and its employment in the particular client that we will summarize in the situation. And then we'll look at some of the lessons learned that we feel strongly were helpful in modifying our methodology and approach for subsequent clients, um, some of which we are engaged with presently. And then finally, we'll look at what all of this means to you and your organizations, potentially. With that, I'd like to go ahead and begin. So again, we were asked to participate in uh, the globalization of a largely U.S.-based pharmaceutical company founded in the early 80s. Um, and they were asking specifically for assistance in the globalization of their current, mostly U.S.-based Argus safety system. The company actually was acquiring another firm that had three separate non-Argus safety applications uh, as in use as their disparate and segregated safety system, and the new pharma company really needed a central repository for all of their global safety data. Alongside all of the technical uh, issues that come with that type of globalization, there are also a large number of process initiatives that would need to be identified, managed, and supported through the globalization process. So we at Biofarm responded with uh, an analysis and update methodology that we had employed in the past with various other clients in the hopes that we could assist this company in the uh, global use of the Argus application in their new paradigm. Specifically, when this 
company acquired the global parts of the previous company, they needed to merge international case management standards, regulatory reporting requirements, and local labeling of these various uh, out-of-U.S. entities into their existing drug safety quality system. So remember, this presentation will focus on what we refer to as the quality system, i.e., processes, procedures, and policies. In this particular company's case, they actually did not have any uh, global safety policies, per se. They had an existing and disparate number of standard operating procedures, 10 of them, between the U.S., the Canadian, French, German, and rest of the world and four uh, work instructions, all of which were very specific to the individual regions that or originated the actual documents. Here's an example of those original documents that we started out with. So this, in fact, was what we refer to as the current state. So as you can see, the various uh, processes and procedures, the SOPs, are very country specific. Uh, they were not really global. And there was some disconnect in the quality system with respect to what level of detail one should have in a process or procedure versus at the work instruction level. As you can see from this diagram, the French uh, entity had procedures and then had very detailed work instructions, whereas the rest of the world, let's say, had only uh, very detailed software specific at times uh, procedures, which was already a, a difference between the various entities. So what did this mean to the client? Well, we knew that the client was going to need to update all of the global procedures that governed currently non-Argus safety systems, and we were going to need to assist in the translation of functionality between that original system and the wording in the current SOPs, and place that wording into more Argus-centric terminology. So there was already going to be a number of updates to the existing documentation. We also needed to find a way to consolidate all of the very country-specific procedures and work instructions into a more manageable quality system so that updates to those procedures or work instructions could occur without disrupting the actual work in progress. So let's begin to look at the various methods that we employ at Biofarm for our process reengineering. In any process reengineering project at Biofarm, we basically segregate the work into three manageable phases. The first phase is the identification of resourcing and scope. And this is a very important phase, and we'll go into the details later. But basically, this is where all of the responsible parties are identified, and really the scope of the project is laid out in more detail than perhaps in the uh, agreement documents set forth prior to the start of the project. We also then, once we have all of the scope and responsible vested parties identified, move then into the standard quality system identification and a typical SWOT analysis. So we, again, we will go into greater detail in a moment, but just to summarize that phase, we will create a standard quality system with policies, procedures and work instructions that based on our practical experience uh, would protect a company from regulatory audit and adhere to current standards in the global 
environment. We partner with the client to ensure that we did not miss anything in that standard and that everyone has consensus and agrees that this, in fact, is the, quote, future state that you want to, to bring the quality system to. Once that future state is determined and defined, we then request copies of all of the existing documentation and we perform a formal SWOT analysis between the documents delivered and the future state, desired state, if you will, uh, outcome. That SWOT analysis feeds into the final phase, which is the assistance in the creation or modification of any of the identified gaps. So the SWOT analysis will feed into a gap report and the gap will be what, what we like to call a roadmap to how we will mitigate all of the gaps in the current quality system. So in brief, they, these are the methods that we use at Biofarm. Where did we come up with this? Well, as all of you probably know, especially those of you involved in any type of globalization effort, or even just a basic process reengineering method, you have probably seen very simplistic or very complicated process reengineering methodologies. So we knew as a consulting firm that we needed to do something that was reproducible, was easy to understand, and really flowed with the constructs of process reengineering, including evaluation, uh, transparency in the documentation of the issues, and mitigation of those issues. We also knew that from the existing research that the use of strengths, uh, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats analyses, or SWOTs, was a very powerful tool in the planning and process initiative area of our world. Helms and Nixon, for example, have documented that in the literature, the SWOT analysis is used comprehensively among all aspects of research and various uh, avenues within the business world and outside of the business world. Also, the SWOT analysis itself is used well beyond strategic planning initiatives. It's used in the evaluation of past research methodologies. Um, there are just a number of various ways that a SWOT analysis is, is utilized, and that gives credit to its, its use and strength as a tool. It also has been around for quite some time. Uh, it is argued right now where the origins of the SWOT analysis come from. There are many origin stories. I won't go into those here. If you're interested, you can Google them. But it has arguably been around since prior to the 1980s. So it is a very time-tested tool as well. So we really felt strongly that the SWOT analysis would render itself uh, as a perfect tool for process reengineering. We also employ a, a employ, sorry, a tool called a RACI diagram. And a RACI diagram becomes a very, very helpful tool in the field of project management to identify the responsible parties, parties who are the approver of particular deliverables in a project, those individuals or groups that should be consulted, and finally those who should be informed uh, to the various deliverables. And this is a great way in any of your projects to keep people focused on the tasks at hand and also to give them a, a heads up of the deliverables that they will be responsible for in the, the execution of the project. So the RACI diagram, as we will see, is a, is a very important tool. And Costello recently published a, a journal article where uh, they indicated that 
the use of the RACI diagram can actually increase the success of the project, given that many times unclear direction in the responsibilities of particular deliverables can cause the project to stall. And so the use of a RACI diagram will actually could be used appropriately to move the project forward. So we also have seen in the use of our SWOT analysis that those weaknesses and threats that are identified can very easily be pulled into a gap analysis document. And that gap analysis document can provide clear traceability to the mitigation strategies or what we'll refer to as the roadmap for all of the identified gaps. So let's start to look at these methodologies maybe a little closer and hopefully it will make sense to everyone. So let's look at the first phase, the identification of participants and the scoping of the project. As I stated, uh, recent research has shown that uh, the use of a RACI table can in fact push the project forward when, in, when the project seems to stall. So it is a preventative method to use a RACI diagram early on in the, the project to clearly communicate the expectations of the team involved. And at this stage of the project, you may be asking yourself, well, how do you know the deliverables? All you've shown us is the current state. We don't yet know how that current state is going to be manipulated and whose responsibility it would be to update or modify any of the, the, the documentation that are identified in the gap, which has not been performed yet. And that's a very good question. So we'll see on the next slide how we mitigate that particular issue. Sorry, I just had to take a drink of water. Okay, so again, the RACI tool when used by us allows us to identify various business units, resources, and clearly stipulate the responsibility of each. We also use it to identify all of the anticipated deliverables within a project. And then most importantly, we must make sure that the client agrees with all of the aspects of the particular process reengineering uh, project. We have found that process reengineering is a really important aspect of change management for a company. And as any of you know who have been involved in any dramatic changes within an organization, change management can be the death of your project. So it's very important that we build consensus and ensure that the client is, uh, feels that the documentation and the methodologies and all of the responsibilities listed in the RACI are in fact owned by them. In this example, you'll see the preliminary RACI for all of the anticipated work. This may or may not be the comprehensive RACI that falls out from the gap analysis. But at least here, it is a tool used for consensus building and again, change management more than anything else. So what you can see that we have done is we have a column here called document type. Document type, because we have not performed the gap analysis yet, we cannot fill this in with specifics. So we have to be very broad in our language. So you can see here safety policies, safety procedures, safety work instructions, and quality procedures. We then have taken all of the vested parties of interest and we have populated the columns in the RACI diagram. We have a QA representative, a U.S. safety, the rest of world safety representative, a U.K. safety person. We also have the corresponding department heads and also a product complaint handling uh, personnel as well as their department head. And then we fill in the RACI. And again, 
A is for the approval, or uh, R is for the responsible or creation initiative for that particular document. C is where someone might contribute to that document. And I is where the information in that deliverable, in this case a document, would just be informed. So let's look at the quality procedures as a good example here. For quality procedure modifications or creation, the responsible party, the persons uh, who are responsible for initiating such changes, will be the product complaint handling personnel. The approvers of those documents will be the corresponding department head and the quality assurance team. Everyone else is an informed member of that particular procedure. So this is a, a technique, again, to clearly delineate responsibilities for the various uh, documents or modifications that need to occur. Once the scope and RACI diagram are completed and everyone agrees on it and we've reached consensus, that's our cue to move on to the next phase. And really the next phase is the definition of our standard safety quality system and the formal SWOT analysis that would occur after gathering all of the required quality docs. Here at BioPharm, we have in our safety team, we are lucky enough to have a variety of personnel who have a wide array of experiences, both in quality control, um, device firms, biotech, pharma, call center, CRO work. So we have seen practically the use of safety systems in all of these various organizations. And this really gives us a, a, a set of knowledge collectively as a team that we can use to assist our clients in developing a standard quality system that really mirrors what they hope to have in their final you know, future state, if you will. So we will draft a quote unquote desired state quality system with policies, procedures, and work instructions and their corresponding titles for each client. And then we meet with the client to, again, build consensus and ensure change management so that they will own the actual definition of the desired state. In this example, we have a very simplistic desired state where we have a single policy here, an overarching policy of safety management, and we have two procedures, standard operating procedures, one for case processing, one for case review, and then within each of the appropriate procedures, we may have one or more work instructions. So this is an example of one of those desired state uh, quality system initiatives. And certainly this is not comprehensive. Uh, I didn't have enough slide space to show you all of the SOPs, work instructions, and policies. So again, once we have that desired state agreed upon between us and the client, and the client feeling as though they've owned the entire definition of the quality system. We will then request the delivery of all of the existing documentation sent to us so that we can formally execute our SWOT analysis. And how do we do this? We take all of the client's existing quality documents, whether they are policies, procedures, or work instructions, and we place them into our desired state quality framework. So policy, our desired state policies are mapped to the client's existing policies. The desired SOP are mapped to the client's SOPs, and the desired work instructions are mapped to the client's work instructions. This allows us to then perform a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat analysis in accordance with the methodology that we're describing. 
So now the SWOT analysis occurs where we compare all of the current state documents to the desired state and we fill in the uh, SWOT table. Once the SWOT table has been completed, we again schedule consensus building meetings with our clients to ensure that they feel included and that the change management is not threatened. The SWOT analysis will naturally identify weaknesses or threats among the various uh, documents. And this is where we will start the process of feeding the gap report table. In this example, you can see that we took a Canadian and a U.S. SOP-01 that mapped to the uh, very first uh, procedure for case processing, and we performed the appropriate strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats identification here. Um, some of the high-level differences between these documents are obvious uh, probably to all of you, which is that they're very country specific. So there are tons of a uh, wealth of uh, Health Canada specific regulatory reporting requirements in this SOP, the Canadian SOP, that do not exist in the U.S. SOP and vice versa. And in a global environment, one would hope that your global SOP would be more comprehensive. So there are definite strengths opportunities, weaknesses, and threats among these different procedures. In some of the work that we've done with process reengineering, and in this particular example we did not perform this type of analysis, but it has often been a requirement, especially for, for whatever reason historically, dealing with medical device firms has often demonstrated the need to perform the SWOT not only against the standard or desired state, but to also take the arms of the organization, which often operate completely independent of one another in a medical device firm, at least in our experiences, and compare those particular procedures against the different business units. So, for example, in a med device firm, you may have a cardiac unit who deals with uh, pacemakers or, or implants of some kind, but you may also have uh, hip replacement business units. And in, in, in our experience, medical device companies will often silo those business units and they will operate completely independently, which results in uh, disparate procedures for similar practices and therefore the need to do a SWOT analysis between those two uh, business units occurs. So you can take the SWOT analysis that we just finished discussing, and with a small modification to it, you can perform the, sw the similar SWOT analysis between your organization arms when there are like-minded procedures in place. Again, once the weaknesses and threats are identified, then we build consensus again ensuring that everyone agrees to our interpretation of the threats and weaknesses. Um, we modify that SWOT analysis report based on feedback from the client. At the end of the day, it's important that the client, again, feel that this is their project and they are owning all of the information herein. In this example, you can see that I have a, a procedure here that was a defined process in our desired state, and then we have three different business units uh, from a medical device firm, all of which have different definitions on how to meet that standard. So obviously we have some synchronization here that needs to occur in the globalization or amalgamation of the final procedure. Uh, so again, Slightly different technique, but I just wanted to show that the SWOT analysis is in fact flexible, and if you need to utilize it for something a bit more complicated, you could. Once all of the SWOT 
analyses are complete and all of the quality documents have been evaluated, then we can extract from the, get, from the SWOT analysis, rather, all of the threats and weaknesses, as well as any opportunities that we want to document in the, let's call it a roadmap report. So here you can see that we have given the gaps identified in the SWOT analysis, particular gap tracing numbers so that we can trace back to uh, the gap itself. And then here, the mitigation strategy. So what exactly are we going to do to resolve the gap that we have identified? Now, one important point here is that we have performed a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I've shown you where to place the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, but it's very vital that you not forget the strengths of the various documents. Just because the globalization of the policies, procedures, and work instructions may indicate that you have gaps in your quality system doesn't mean that there aren't very good things about each and every one of the quality documents that you're evaluating. And it's important that you extract those strengths into your new globalized policy procedure or work instruction. We don't want to lose the good things. We just want to merge all and mitigate all of the issues that we find. So once all of the gaps have been identified, we then will take the gap report, the roadmap report, and we will have to modify our RACI. So here you can see I've taken the original RACI diagram where we originally agreed on all of the participants' roles and responsibilities, and now I've modified it with very specific mitigation strategies. So here you can see all of the various controlled documents that will either need to be modified or created, and then we've corresponded the RACI or RACI responsibilities for each of those documents. Again, once the RACI diagram is completed, we must meet with the client to ensure that everyone agrees upon the work and, and that there are resources available to perform the work. Now, we do have a, a large amount of experience at Biofarm in the creation of quality documents. However, as I stated before, one of the biggest threats to any type of process reengineering initiative is in fact that aspect of consensus building and change management. In our opinion, having any external resource write your policies, procedures, and work instructions is probably not the best of ideas. It doesn't foster ownership within your organization. And let's face it, at the end of the day, as a consultant, I get to leave your company, and I'm going to leave behind whatever I've created. And if I've created something that doesn't work for you, it's not going to build a positive relationship between our company and yours, nor will it set your company up for regulatory success, which is really the most important part. So as a result, we highly encourage the process of documentation creation and updates in any methodology, that that should be iterative and interactive by nature. We use WebEx, but there are a number of other collaboration tools available to you. And we just feel it's very important and cannot be stressed enough that the updates, modifications, or creation of new quality documents be very iterative and interactive in the various meetings. This, again, will ensure ownership, a, a very substantial feeling of ownership by the client, and also uh, will encourage the building of, of consensus. 
So exactly what was the impact of this methodology on the client that, that we're discussing today? Well, this is the final uh, state that we were able to work with them on. So you can see here we have two procedures and eight work instructions, all of which are global now, none of which have anything specific in their country, uh, as far as country goes, in their title. They are used by every aspect of the organization, be it France, Germany, England, uh, the U.S., where, where rest of the world, all of the individuals in the company performing case processing or management follow these SOPs and work instructions. So this allowed us to expand very U.S.-centric work instructions into eight very global, broad, yet specific uh, work instructions specific to the Argus application. We were also able to take 10 uh, very highly specific, country-specific procedures and reduce them into two broad uh, global SOPs. Again, all of the, the U.S.-centric procedures and work instructions were modified to include comprehensive global information that was very important to the success of the company using Argus. Now this is where our strengths and opportunities were very vital. So in the updating of the country-centric policies and procedures, you must go back to the SWOT analysis and review the strengths and opportunities and ensure that you have incorporated those into the central document. Um, this is a, an, a very important point and you don't want to, to miss that in the methodology. One of the other aspects of this work that is not surprising to us now, but back when we began this work many years ago, it, it was a bit surprising. The process engineering work often dovetailed very quickly into the identification of software configuration changes that were required. Um, and this uh, is also a very important point to keep in mind as you go through your process reengineering initiatives. So now I'd just like to cover a few lessons learned from the initiative here. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we had and the lessons that we learned therein was that access and collection of the quality documentation is very important. Uh, it really allows us to accurately and comprehensively evaluate the quality system and the timely delivery of this, these documents to whomever is performing the SWOT analysis is absolutely critical. Um, when dealing with third-party vendors like Biofarm, you want to make sure that there are clear statements of work involved and non-disclosure agreements in place so that there are not issues with sharing comprehensive quality documents between the organizations. Uh, we also found that the GAP report was very important. This roadmap became very important to allow us uh, project focus when it came to the updating and creation of documents. So even though the SWOT analysis is the root of it, that roadmap report is really an important tool for the, the focus and effort of the project itself. I think I've stressed the iterative and interactive necessity of meetings, um, so I won't state that again. And then finally, something to keep in mind here is that global part participation is often divergent and can be difficult. Uh, it's kind of like herding cats at, at some point. And while you might be gathering information from disparate sources, performing your SWOT analyses on the various uh, documents, it is really important that all of the global participants feel as though they have been heard 
and that their desires have been addressed within the procedures, policies, and work instructions. This is, like I said, sometimes very difficult to do. There can be language barriers, cultural barriers, and other normative factors that make these difficult, th these meetings rather difficult to, to facilitate. So one way that we found that assists us in that effort is through the use of Microsoft Word's track changes and comment area. So we worked on a single document, and all of our comments and edits from a global perspective were tracked. And each iterative and interactive meeting, we went through every comment and every modification to build consensus uh, in these documents. It's also important to note that even after all of that consolidation and every single one of those iterative and interactive meetings, the business processes and procedures for, let's say, each country may be so specific and unique that they don't fit in a global procedure or work instruction. I think it's important to understand that that could be perfectly okay that consolidation should be a goal rather than your finite rule. Uh, it is entirely possible that the consolidation can only occur at the policy and procedure level and that individual departmental or country specific potentially regional work instructions might need to be created. Um, examples here might include the differences in local labeling or competent authority reporting that might need only be documented in, let's say, an EU member state. Um, one that came up in this particular project was the German regulatory, the Bee Farm Agency's requirement to have the reportable cases evaluated at a scientific level as well as a medical level. That scientific review uh, was very specific to the German colleagues. Okay. And then finally, the final lesson learned for us was really that, uh, surprisingly, procedural work here, quality system work, can often bring out configuration changes that need to occur in your software in order to facilitate those types of procedural changes. So there needs to be a fluidity between your process reengineering team and the implementation team who might be changing the underlying software for you. So as many of my professors have said in the past, so what and who cares? So that's what this slide's for. For those of you who are ready to engage with us, perhaps you want to set up a proof of concept meeting with us or a scope discussion to see if any of the methods and documents that we've discussed in this webinar would be useful to your organization. Maybe, maybe not. For those of you who are not quite ready yet, who are curious still, you might want to schedule some pre-engagement uh, calls with us. Maybe we could provide some question and answers or guidance on, on similar projects. And what happens if you're a company that's already in the midst of a process reengineering project? And let's say that, uh, like Costello alluded to, your project has stalled. Then maybe you reach out to us and see if we might be able to assist you in refining your processes to include some of these methods that we've used in the past that have proven to us to be quite successful, again, at large generic companies and large medical device firms, as well as a number of smaller to mid-sized organizations. I've given you a slide here with the two references that used in the presentation. You can read those on your own. And again, if you have any further questions or comments, suggestions, please contact uh, one of the many people on this slide.